put the who's in on the whatsy. Attach the whatsy to the who'sy. Connect the thingamajig to the thingamabob. And that'll make the whatchamacall it. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Making Records with Eric Valentine. It's been a little bit. I've been on some holiday adventures. A lot has happened. Um, I'm excited about this episode because there's... A lot has happened. A lot of interesting stuff happened while I was running around. So um, there's going to be a little bit of uh, this preamble here to get caught up on things before we get into the, the meat of this particular episode. Um, so yeah, you know, a little over a month ago we took off and um, we're hanging out in Vermont for a while with family. Had a lovely time out there. It was beautiful, snowy. You all saw one one episode where it was snowing behind me and it was just amazing out there. It was really, really incredible. And um, then after that, we went to London. And um, the reason to go there was because uh, Grace was invited to sing at Royal, Royal Albert Hall. Um, we had uh, met, we crossed paths with this amazing guy, a film composer named uh, Michael Giacchino. And... Uh, uh, we've just stayed in touch, remained friends, hung out a couple times, and he, he is hosting a Christmas variety show at Royal Albert Hall and asked uh, Grace to come and sing. So, um, you know, it took all of about three nanoseconds to go like, yeah, we'll do that. And, uh, and so we went out there. Um, that was totally incredible. Uh, so uh, Grace got to sing um, in that venue with the, um, you know, Royal Albert Hall, their sort of resident symphony orchestra. And um, the other thing that was really special about it is that she got to actually perform a song that she, that she wrote. She wrote this Christmas song a couple years ago called uh, Christmas Moon, um, which was also kind of a crazy story. She got asked to do a Christmas compilation record that Paul McCartney does. And uh, there was a mix-up with the song that she, she wanted to do. It ended up not being available. And so they felt bad about it and said, OK, you can do whatever song you want. Um, and the, the whole deal with these Christmas albums is that um, uh, Paul McCartney is big into music publishing. So she, he's bought a lot of the huge, famous, classic Christmas songs, you know, like the Christmas song, Chestnuts, um, all, all, like he owns a bunch of these songs. And so he puts out these Christmas compilation records that have um, all of the songs that he owns the publishing on, and he asks new bands to do versions of them so he can make the publishing. Um, and so that's what it's supposed to be, but because of the mix-up, they said you can do whatever you want, and we started thinking about, oh, okay, so we can do any Christmas song. We were thinking about stuff, and finally I was like, she just write a song, you know, and uh, and it's kind of moments like those where Grace really, really um, comes to, you know, like really shines when it's like, oh, write a Christmas song. OK, I'll just do that. And she wrote this incredible song called Christmas Moon. It's one of these songs that just sounds like it's been around forever, like it's just always been there. And um, so she did that, and uh, it ended up on that record. Um, it turned out really cool, and we did a, a real traditional um, arrangement of it. You know, I wanted to try and do like a Nelson Riddle style, Nat King Cole um, kind of arrangement. So um, we brought in this amazing guy, Harlan Hodges. Um, he helped with the arrangement, and um, uh, Rob Moose played strings on it, a bunch of cool stuff. Um, so you can check that out. But she got to perform that live, that song that she wrote at Royal Albert Hall for everybody. Totally surreal, magical experience. Um, totally amazing. Um, so then, uh, since I was going to be out in London, uh, you know, uh, I ended up having a little event of my own. Um, this uh, um, a sort of a live in-person making records thing um, at SX Pro. Um, they're a dealer of undertone audio stuff, and um, we had been talking about the possibility of me doing an event there, so I was around, so we, we did that, and it was super fun, man. We, we had a great time. Um, a bunch of folks showed up. I did two rounds of uh, doing a mix demonstration and demonstrating undertone audio equipment and all that stuff. Um, so we had a great time with that. Um, and, and just in general, like London is so beautiful uh, during the holidays. They have this whole winter wonderland thing set up in Hyde Park. So we went and did that with uh, Sagan. 
just ran around, saw the sites, went to the museums, had a whole museum day. Incredible museums there. So we had an amazing time uh, there in London, then came back um, to the States, went to Northern California to visit with my family, got food poisoning <laughs> somewhere in our travels on the way back. And uh, so, you know, like the 24th was a, a rough, a rough day. <laughs> we pretty much spent Christmas on the toilet. Um, uh, but, you know, pulled it together on the 25th. So we actually got to spend some time with my family and then finally got home. Uh, and it's so good to be home here in Topanga Dice. Um, you know, we were a bunch of wonderful, amazing places, but uh, it's, it's true. There's no place like home. Uh, so it's good to be back. And, um, and finally, I'm kind of settled back in and, and here to do another episode. So, um, yeah, there, you know, there was actually a, a couple other really incredible things that happened along the way that I just kind of glossed over that I wanted to touch on. Um, at the SX Pro event, I got to meet um, Jurgen Strauss, the maker of these crazy Strauss monitors that, that I use um, in, uh, in Topanga Night Studios. And uh, so I finally got to meet him in person, and he is incredible, man. It was so cool to meet him. He is one of these just incredibly passionate, you know, human beings that is just on a quest to make the, you know, the most extraordinary speakers you can possibly conceive of. And, um, and he has a, he's finally releasing a new model speaker. Uh, I hope I'm remembering this right. It's the MF4. And uh, they were set up at SX Pro, so I got to do the demonstration with those speakers. And oh my lord, these speakers are incredible. They're amazing because he um, he'd had three models for all this time. The ones that I use, which are the near fields, these NF3s. Um, then there was a another midfield, um, which I think was maybe the MF1. I apologize. I don't. I, I may not be remembering all these models right. And then he had these really large ones, which were like the MF2s, I think, and um, I was, I, I, you know, was blown away by the near fields. I got those, his large ones, I may have mentioned this before, but those are totally incredible, uh, but they're just super expensive and insane, um, but man, they sound amazing, and then now he has a new midfield, um, this MF4, that is unbelievable. Uh, he spent most of the time designing a custom low frequency driver for this thing. And he achieved stuff. We were talking about the, the specs and what, what all he went through to have this thing happen. It's one of these rare occasions. There are very few people on the planet that can say this, but he has created something that nobody else on the planet has come even close to. The, the performance of this speaker is completely unprecedented. Um, on paper and in the room. It's just amazing. Um, so depending on what happens in my whole world of stuff, I'm, I, I will be trying to figure out how to, how to get a pair of those speakers. They're, they're, they're not cheap. Um, a pair of them's like, I think, 18 grand, something like that. But um, uh, yeah, so that was amazing. Those things were totally incredible. Um, I could use those even with just one of these 12-inch drivers. Definitely wouldn't need a sub. They, they're just, they're incredible. Um, and then, uh, and then also I got to check out the Trinov um, speaker tuning system because um, SX Pro, they have a, a listening room set up there and it's good, but it's not incredible. They didn't like go crazy trying to do a, tons and tons of acoustic treatment. And so, you know, just like any room, it has, it's got issues. And, um, and so, I had an opportunity to actually hear what the Trinov um, speaker tuning system does. That is also totally amazing. Completely blew me away. Um, I'm definitely, I'll probably be getting one of those systems um, soon, uh, sometime in the next couple months, um, and just replace all of my manual EQing and all of that bullshit that I've been doing um, and just switch to that because that thing is, it just blew me away. It does more than just um, EQ. Uh, if I get one in here, I'll be able to talk about that. So I wanted to share all that, too. It's just a, a bunch of really uh, incredible stuff going on with all that. Um, yeah, it's just cool like to you know, experience new things that um, are in exciting and it's inspiring and I feel like are going to create opportunities for me to get better at what I do, you know. Um, so that was super cool. Uh, I'm trying to think what else. 
Did I miss anything? Um, yeah, I think I think that was everything. So if um, if I remember right, uh, uh, when I did when I announced the um, the event at, in London, the SX Pro thing, right? Actually, turned out was not actually in London. It was <laughs> quite far from London. Um, uh, there was, you know, I was going to have a, um, have people, you know, uh, essentially vote on what song they wanted me to, to do there of, of, a, you know, any of the Slash songs that I've worked on. And the, the voting was such <laughs> a definitive win for the song By the Sword. So that's what I did a mixed demonstration with, um, in, uh, at SX Pro. And I felt like, that was so by far the winner um, that I should do the same thing for um, the, you know, um, YouTube channel viewers because um, there wasn't even a close second. So I, I feel like if I chose a different song for, for YouTube, people might be disappointed. So, so I'm going to do that um, today right here. It's probably obvious by the title of this episode that that's gonna, what's going to happen. Um, so that's what we're doing by the sword. And um, this was a, a really cool, interesting journey um, for me because I got to, you know, pull up that multi-track master. Um, it was mixed on kind of a crazy setup at the time. This was um, in the sort of transition time between consoles. I hadn't quite finished building the custom undertone con under undertone audio console, um, but um, I had gotten rid of the uh, the Neve 88 R console that I had, so I had this like kind of makeshift interim setup where I had, you know, um, a big sidecar of uh, a um, EMI TGI 24 channel console, you know, uh, an amazing console to have in the room. So I had a bunch of those channels that I could run stuff through for EQing and stuff and some busing and whatever. And then I just had a bank of these um, automatable faders and a bunch of outboard gear. So it was this, you know, kind of um, kludge together setup that I used to mix the, uh, the, the song originally. Um, I can't recreate that setup. I don't have any of that stuff anymore. And so... Um, so I remixed the song um, with my setup now. I was actually, I would have preferred to do that anyways. Um, I really, really like the setup that I use now. And boy, did this <laughs> remix of the song turn out a lot better. Um, uh, yeah, kind of terrifyingly uh, a huge improve, improvement. Um, I don't know what I was doing uh, on, on the the actual released version of that song. People apparently enjoyed it because uh, everybody's requesting it. But um, uh, so it, you know, it, I, I suppose it wasn't a problem. But I, I I think you'll all agree when you hear me a b between this new mix version that I did um, and the original, it's just not they're not even comparable. Um, and so, yeah, so it was very interesting. And, and I think, you know, probably the majority of the difference um, is, is the monitoring that I use now. Um, even, if, you know, even with all of my excitement about these new things that I think can even further improve the monitoring, the monitoring that I have now is such a huge improvement over what I had when I was um, mixing that Slash record that... Um, I, I think that's the main thing. It's it's um, it's so dramatic, um, and I, on the original mix, I can hear very clearly my confusion in the mid range, and um, there are choices that I'm making on the new mix now that I just would have never ever ever done um, on my old monitoring. I just my, the speakers would have let, never let my ears choose that, and so that's been really interesting to experience as I pull up old mixes and, um, and dig through them. Um, so yeah, so you'll, you'll be able to check that out. So I guess, why don't we dive into this? I don't think there's any other things that are important to know before we start checking this out. I'm just going to play the song first. Um, here's the session. Uh, it's pretty simple. Um, you know, there's not a whole lot to it. Do, 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 do. Um, and so um, let's just hear the song first. I'll just play it through the first whatever verse and whatever thing. You can, you guys can all get familiar with this thing. Here is Slash and Andrew Stockdale from Wolf Mother, By the Sword. Horses that 
So you get the idea. It's uh, just a, a big old rock song. Um, there's some cool moments in there, some like reverb splashes that uh, that happen on his guitar solo, and when uh, Andrew kind of goes off into his vocal uh, wailing moment there. Uh, but it's really pretty straightforward. You know, it's just uh, some big old rock drums, bass, guitar. Uh, I think there's a total of only three guitar passes on the whole thing. Um, the vocals, that's it. You know, like uh, there's sections where the vocals are doubled, but 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 that's it. You know, there's, there's not much to it. Um, you know, it's uh, it's it's easy when you <laughs> have a great great rock band. Um, so let's uh, let's do let's do the comparison to the original mix really quick. I, I think I think I want to just get that out of the way right now because um, it's kind of unbelievable. Uh, so let me go back here. We'll go right to where all the where all the serious stuff starts to happen. Um, so right before it gets big. So this again, this is this is where we are now. We'll hear this transition into the, with the band coming in, and then I'll I'll switch to um, the original mix. Okay, so now this is the original mix.
So, I mean, <laughs> it's just a, a hilarious difference. I, I can really hear my confusion about the mid-range um, on that original mix. And, you know, I think it was so much to do with uh, the monitoring. Um, you know, I, I worked hard to try and um, get the monitoring to, you know, be as good as possible over there in Barefoot uh, for a long time. But this was still, you know, I hadn't quite really settled in um, with where I, end, uh, you know, where I ended up with it now. And, um, you know, NS10s and Yuri A13Cs, man, those are some super mid-range forward speakers. And there are certain things that I would just never do on those speakers. There are certain mid-range frequencies I would never boost on those speakers because it was so unpleasant in the room. There was just no way I could get myself to do it. And, uh, you know, since switching to these, these Strauss monitors, um, the, there's so much clarity. I just feel so much more confident making choices in the mid range. And, and I'll, you know, when we go through this, you'll, I'll point out the moments where it's like, okay, that's something I just never would have done before. And, you know, listening to the two, there's just so much separation, um, between all this stuff that really ultimately is trying to, you know, fight for the same space in the mid range. Um, it's all competing for that like you know any anywhere from 500 all the way up to 5k all of that that whole area there is so you know crowded in rock music because of the guitar and where the vocals sit and all that and on this new mix you know i feel like i was able to have the drums own their little place and the bass you know fills in underneath the guitars the guitars sit squarely on top of the bass there's even stuff you know on the on the original mix where the vocals are getting tangled up with sort of the the low mid of the drums and guitar and bass and you know man it's it was just a mess so um and the the, the new one just it just sounds bigger and more finished and everything um the original one just sounded kind of small um that transition when the band first comes in was something i really remember str struggling with and and, you know, I think it's one of those things, it's a lesson that I learned over and over and over and over and over. It's like, you know, if things really aren't feeling exciting in the right way, it just, it means that the EQing is not right. Um, all, the, all the compression in the world and, and all the level balancing in the world is not going to fix having things not EQ'd right. Um, and it's just everything, you know, everything falls into place easily once you have stuff voice the right way so they're not all fighting for the same area you know like this newer mix is unquestionably a little more present sounding but it's actually less harsh to me because the the elements are not fighting for the same frequencies when when everything's piling up and everything's fighting for the same frequencies that's when it gets kind of harsh and hard to listen to to me even though there's not a huge amount of you know not as much brightness on the original mix when you try and turn the thing up really loud it just sounds crowded and unclear and you know um just kind of congested in the mid-range so so there you go there's my my confessional about the <laughs> original mix but it was just so cool to like pull this thing up again and very easily go oh i would do this this and this and have it land in a place that is just so much more satisfying to me now i don't know there may be people that prefer the original mix i'm sure <laughs> there's always somebody that likes something you know um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I'm way happier where this thing ended up now. So let's start going through it. I'm going to start with, um, the mix bus stuff. I always feel like if I don't do that at the beginning, I'll end up forgetting and not do it. So we'll start with the buses and then work our way through the individual tracks. Here we go. So it's my usual busing architecture. Um, there's a music bus that has... Uh, a couple things on it. Um, it's just uh, this guy. I like this multiband guy on my music bus sometimes. Um, it just felt like this kind of low mid and, you know, part of the lows needed a little extra dynamic control. I wanted to have a lot of that in there, but um, it was just kind of poking out at times. So just specifically compressing that area. And then this is a hardware insert, which is the unfair child. So we'll check that out in a second. Um, the vocals, there's nothing on the main mix bus. I did end up doing a little volume automation on these just to make it easy um, to bring the vocals up to be able to keep up with um, the excitement of the music when uh, things get louder later on in the song. So it was handy for that. And then these two go to a bus called Mix. And this, this in-the-box version of the mix bus, um, I set that up because I started this 
uh, mix in uh, Topanga Dice, and then um, I ended up having to finish it with headphones when we were traveling over the holidays leading up to doing this event um, in London. So, um, so I had to come up with sort of a um, placeholder um, music bus in the box music bus thing. So I had a compressor that I put on there that felt at least similar to the Unfair Child so I could try and finish the rest of the mix. Um, so you know, it's an interesting comparison. I'll, I'll, we'll do that as well. So yeah, so the vocals and music end up going to the final mix bus here. There's also a, a drum bus uh, in this mix. Um, there was some really nice processing that needed to be done on the whole drum kit, so we'll go through all that. So let's check out what's happening on this mix bus. Um, we'll start with this guy. Uh, I'm just going to let it play. I'll mute the vocals for a second. So you can kind of hear what it's doing, you know, it adds more density to that frequency range um, without it getting out of control and sort of overextending the, the speakers at times when there is a little too much dynamics. And it also, um, I like the way th that frequency range impacts, you know, with the kick drum and the snare drum with that thing on there. There's something about it that, that feels like it just lands a little better. Um, so that was really sort of the point of that. Um, and so then here's the unfair child part of it. Uh, you can hear what that's doing. It's doing a lot of work on this mix. Um, you'll hear it immediately. So, you know, uh, that, that's a lot. The mix, the mix definitely kind of falls apart without it. Um, the drums are not being hugely compressed um, on their drum bus, and so a lot of the impact and compression character in the drums is coming from that overall music bus, and everything gets sort of like, you know, glued together uh, in that bus. And I have a lot more leeway to do that because this isn't a hugely complex mix. It's just drums, bass, and a couple guitars. And... Um, and so the vocals go to a separate thing, and so that the unfair child can do a lot of work to sort of make that whole music bus happen. So um, you can hear what it's doing. You know, it's adding that impact to the drums. It's holding everything in place better, and it's bringing out the guitars because the guitars are sort of sustaining in between all of those peaks, you know, those impacts of the drums, and so all that comes forward as the, the drums are getting compressed on their, their impacts. And it adds this, this kind of high-end energy. It's just a, a part of the character of, of the unfair child. Um, and, you know, the, unfortunately, the, the volume is not matched particularly well. I, I, I set it in a sweet spot, so it is, you know, getting a little more harmonic color overall. Um, that's just felt right for this mix, but the, um, you know, the volume balance in the comparison is a little not super close. So... Uh, makes it a little harder to tell. Maybe I'll be able to balance that better out once I put it in the video editor or something. Um, but there you go. Um, 
Here, I'll show you the settings uh, that I'm using here. Uh, and actually, it's worth hearing just that very beginning because it. I sort of designed the compression to make those first big hits, those first big boom, boom things um, impact uh, the right way for me. So check this out without it. And then here it is with it. just pulls everything together. So um, I have it in variable three, uh, and so that means I'm setting a slower attack time uh, with uh, capacitively, and it has a different quality, and it really felt right on this mix. So variable three and the individual controls all the way uh, in its fastest position. So that attack time is being derived entirely capacitively. And then I slowed it down a little bit resistively here. I'm using these references just in case you've seen the actual Unfair Child episode. Um, but yeah, so this, these are basically capacitors, these are resistors in order to derive the time constants, the attack and release times. Um, DC threshold is set pretty high, it's at five, and so that means it's a little grabbier on those peaks, you know? And then, you know, the, the input and threshold is really just set to taste. It's just so you're getting the right amount of color in there. You know, the, the higher you set the overall gain, the more coloration you get. And then this is just, you know, determines how much compression you're gonna have. So um, side chains bypass, there's no side chain EQ going on, or it's it's definitely in feedback mode. Um, you know, so I didn't, didn't use feed forward on this. So um, that's the setting and it's, <coughs> you know, a huge part of what's making this thing work. So let's compare it to uh, the in the box version. So first I actually threw together this thing which is um, an, a, a Fairchild, <laughs> you know here's the the UAD Fairchild um, sort of simulating this this setting. I mean I can't I can't really <coughs> I can't really exactly duplicate the unfair child setting because it doesn't have the variable modes that the unfair child has. So the attack time is going to be faster on this and whatnot, but you know, you'll get the idea. Um, as close as I can get it. So here it is with this guy. It's triggering about the same amount of compression. That's, that was happening on the uh, Unfair Child. So there's the Unfair Child again. Plug in. So the, the main thing for me is, uh, is in the low end. The, the way the low end impacts with the unfair child is just a whole other world um, to my ears. Uh, it, there's just like this bloom that happens in the low end after it grabs that um, is just feels thick and powerful in the low end. And, um, and the, the, the low end with the plug-in just feels kind of restrained to me. Um, you know, it just it loses weight and loses impact. So. Um, I don't know, just uh, <laughs> interesting comparison there. Uh, so then, <clears throat> that is actually not the plug, I did that just out of curiosity, not the plugin that I used to actually work with when I was doing, working with my headphones and laptop. I ended up using this thing, which is a whole lot closer. Um, so you can check this out. This is, you know, the, um, 
uh, UBK AR1 thing. And this is uh, kind of the closest that I've found to being able to replicate a tube compressor. Um, it has some really cool qualities to it. Check this out. Um, so we'll start with the plug-in. So uh, that's definitely closer to me. It's, it's still the way the, the kick drum and the low end impacts on the unfair child is, is still just better to me. But um, there are some qualities that I really like um, in that, um, that AR1 thing. It, um, it's adding some excitement in the mid range um, that's very musical to me. Um, it adds this presence in the mid range that's not harsh at all, uh, just super, super musical. So. Um, it, it has some really cool qualities to it. I think if, uh, if the low end impacted more similar to the, um, to the unfair child, um, you know, it, it would be an incredible tool. Um, and it actually is. I mean, I, I, I use it on the drums in this mix, and, uh, um, and it works great in a lot of circumstances. Um, so there's the, the comparison of that stuff. Um, we'll stick with our hardware stuff. And so then the next bus is the um the drum bus so here's all the drum stuff i'm gonna i'm gonna solo all this so we've got my old buddy cq a uh, couple db at 2.3k couple db at 1.5k I'm doing this vinyl, this waves vinyl thing. It worked really cool on this. We'll, we'll, we'll A, B that in a second. And then the, the AR1, like I just mentioned, this is on the whole drum kit. It's set pretty extreme. And, uh, and I just have the, uh, just a little bit of the mix in there. It's, it's you know, it's only 17% wet. And so uh, it's mostly dry. So the drums really aren't being compressed that much on the drum mix bus. Most of the compression is happening from the unfair trial, you know, in the main music bus. So then, um, a little bit of, you know, mid-range pop in there with spiff. So this is, you know, right around whatever this is. Um, 1.5K. And then a little bit of extra low end after this um, compressor. Sometimes I, I like to make up a little low end after the compressor. Um, so let's check these out. And this one has a big level adjustment, so I'm just going to bypass the, the, the individual bands here. This is, there's not a lot going on there. Okay, so here's the extra. 2.3K, the extra 1.5K, just adds more bark to the snare drum. Now check out this vinyl thing. This is... I love the way this thing is energizing the, the high end. So without it, with it.
and you know it's doing it's doing that thing that I'm always chasing where you know tape machines and vinyl they do this thing where the amount of distortion increases as you as the frequencies get higher and higher and higher and so um, and so this the vinyl thing is definitely doing that um, I think they got that part of it right and so it does this cool thing where it sort of you know smooths out the the high frequency stuff and doesn't poke as much you know um, the attacks of the drums are less pokey the cymbals feel kind of shimmery and less kind of hard and metallic. Um, so here, let's check out the, this guy. This is mostly just thickening. That's without it. And then spiff. little extra knock just on the attack or the kick and snare without it back in okay and then here's my extra my extra low end yeah add some nice weight So there's the drum bus, you know, it's pretty straightforward. Just a little EQ, a little compression, parallel compression blended in there. Um, and, uh, and that vinyl thing, that vinyl thing is, is, is pretty, pretty darn wonderful. That's probably my, my most successful usage of that thing so far. Uh, and so then let's get into the, to the individual mics. So the miking of these drums um, <clears throat> was very simple. Uh, this album was recorded onto the Scully, my Scully uh, 2 inch 16 track. So I did not have a huge amount of tracks and I had a whole band playing. So there was Josh Freeze playing drums, Chris Chaney playing bass, um, obviously Slash playing guitar and Andrew was playing a 12 string electric at the same time. So I had all that stuff going at the same time onto a 16 track master. And so I had five tracks available for the drums. So there's a kick mic, snare mic, um, an overhead left, overhead right, and then um, just a mono room mic, and that was, that's it. That's the whole drum thing. There, there is actually this, um, uh, there was a mic in the center of the drum kit that got sent to a couple of guitar amps that was in my chamber um, to add this sort of weird spring reverby, you know, distorted drum effect to it. It's barely blended in there, but we'll check that out as well. Um, so, so, you know, those are the main, the, the main five mics, um, what I explained there. So the kick drum was a U67 and I put it probably about four or five feet out in front of the kick drum. Um, I, I, on this one, I really wanted to just, you know, try and make it work with as few mics as possible. And so that kick drum mic was placed in a way where it actually, you know, helps the snare drum sound and helps the tom sounds and, you know, because it's getting some more room sound on these other things and, you know, it's not going to hurt the, the sound of those. It'll actually enhance those if all the phasing lines up and everything works out. So I really played with the positioning of that a lot. Did some baffling so I don't get too much cymbals into that, um, you know, into that kick drum mic. So we had a, you know, a sort of a crash ride off to one side, a crash cymbal and hi-hat off to the other side. I put these, you know, um, fiberglass baffles that mostly just dampen, you know, the really harsh high end off of the, uh, the cymbals so they don't, that doesn't get into the kick drum mic. Um, and then the snare drum mic, pretty sure it was just a 57, nothing, nothing special there. Um, and the overheads were my C12As. Uh, C12As are really incredible, uh, you know, uh, overhead drum, drum set mics. And... I was trying to do my version of the sort of Glenn Johns over under thing. Um, and so, you know, his thing is like there's a mic over the hi hat, the rack tom, crash cymbals, snare drum over here. Totally get that. Works great. And then the other mic looks across the floor tom, you know, at the snare drum and the batter side of the kick drum. And uh, that's the one that has never really <laughs> worked that great for me. I, you know, um, I, it, it works for him, but uh, it always the phasing feels a little weird on it, and uh, it's just kind of an odd perspective to grab if you're trying to make a stereo pair out of it. So I ended up starting. I kept playing with the position of this mic and bringing it up and bringing it up until it was kind of more like this. And so this guy 
and this guy are equal distances from the snare drum, but they're more looking from the same plane instead of being on totally different axes, you know? And, uh, and, so, and this guy's up over, but nice and close to the floor tom, and it still gets a lot of like the, the attack batter of the kick drum. Um, and it really ended up working out great for this. This is probably one of, uh, you know, one of my favorite uh, drum recordings, uh, certainly on this project, where everything just fell right together. Um, the majority of the drum sound is coming from those, those drum kit microphones. Um, and then there's a lot of the kick drum, you know, I have a, a lot of kick drum in the, in the blend. Um, and I'm using a little bit of the snare drum mic just to sort of fill in some gaps um, in, the, in, in the drum kit mics and, and, you know, enhance a little bit more of a center focus. But these overhead mics, the snare drum sounds great in them. And so most of the snare drum sound is coming from those. And there's just a little bit from the actual snare drum mic. And then there's just a little bit of the mono room mic just to give a little bit of the sense of the like the powerful sound of the drums in the room um so that's how it was mic'd i'm trying to think uh i don't remember what the mic was for the room mic. it was probably in 87 something like that um so here is the kick drum so you can hear there's a lot of like room sound on the snare drum on there and it's good room sound I like that room sound. So we've got a whole lot of EQ on there. That's without it. And this drum uh, was my red uh, Vista Light Ludwig kick drum. The snare drum was um, my Tama Bell Brass. And the toms were sonar, um, you know, square sizes, probably, um, probably a 14-inch rack tom, big toms, 14-inch rack tom, and a 16-inch uh, floor tom. Um, and so, yeah, the, with the position that the mic was in, um, I definitely needed to enhance the low end a lot. And so I did a ton of this, like, 78 hertz, which is kind of more of like a more classic rock voicing of the kick drum. You know, modern kick drums are definitely, you know, voiced a lot lower than that, but I wanted to have that more sort of like, you know, Zeppelin era punch in the kick drum. So that's this move here. I am enhancing, there's, there's some really great subby stuff coming off of this kick drum. It's not hugely dampened down. You can hear it ringing out. And so there's a high pass there that's getting rid of the really excessively subby stuff and then, you know, enhancing right around 40 hertz. So. So there's that guy. And then as a part of the kick drum, I took my one mono room mic, and some people have asked about this. It's a quality that apparently um, shows up in my kick drums a fair amount, where there's just kind of like this airy, roomy quality to them, and this is a huge part of how I do that. Um, you know, this one was pretty easy because the kick mic was already pretty far away. You're definitely getting, a, a, you know, sort of a more airy, roomy sound there, but I, I wasn't getting enough, and once you get all the guitars and bass and other stuff going on, you start to not hear that room on the kick drum enough. And so um, I'm gating that mono room mic specifically to make sure you hear the sound of the kick drum in the room. And so this is that, that signal right here. It's a duplicate of this mono room. And so I put it here, there's a gate on it. It's being keyed from this copy of the kick drum mic. <laughs> I had to make a copy because I had to pull the thing forward. Still, I don't know what's going on with the delay compensation on side chains and Pro Tools. I actually looked in the preferences. Uh, I'm using Pro Tools Ultimate 12 19.5 or something like that. I think they actually removed that selection where you can check a box to have it compensate side chains because maybe they know it doesn't work. Um, and uh, I even tried the trick where I sent this same bus to the final output so it would compensate. None of that worked. And so 
I just had to duplicate the kick drum track, pull it forward so it would actually gate right. So as far as I can tell, maybe there's still a trick to it. That does not work in Pro Tools. So I just have to do it manually. So this track has pulled forward a few thousand samples to make sure that it's keying and opening this gate at the right time. So there's a send here, which is on pre. So, you know, I can leave this thing turned all the way down. And, um, and it shows up here. That same bus shows up here to key the gate. You can, do, you can hear it doing its thing there. And so this, I'm taking off more of the subby stuff and really emphasizing this punchy sort of 100 hertz range. And then also this kind of like mid-range air, this kind of bah sound, you know, in the kick drum that's in the room mic. And then there's a little bit of a slap delay on there to give it that sort of, you know, bottom when the levee breaks thing. So this is like a 16th note timed delay, just 15% of it, you just a little ghost of it in there. So you can hear that. That's with it. That's without it. It's a big difference. And when you hear it in context with everything else, it's a, even a bigger deal because once all the guitars and stuff are going, you really start to lose the room sound on the kick drum. You know, even though this kick drum is miked four feet away, it still starts to sound like just a click with some low end attached to it. That's not what I want. I want that. I want to hear that kick drum in the room. So this is how I'm doing it. And uh, I have a duplicate of the, of the main kick drum here just for the beginning. I worked a, a, a fair amount on these first few hits. It's, an insanely important moment in this song. It's the moment when the band comes crashing in and it has to really feel right. And so um, I, I have this extra compressed kick drum signal. Everything is sort of EQ'd the same. And I used uh, Soothe to kind of tame the cymbals a little bit. You'll see it automate up here. And so it just adds thickness and more of an explosive quality and impact to those first hits. Um, you can hear it with it. Without it. Yeah, just not intense enough, you know. So then um, the snare drum, like I said, is uh, Tom Bell brass, just 57 on it. And this snare drum sound is not really designed to sound like a finished snare drum sound from this microphone. It's really meant to complement what the overheads are doing. And so um, check this out. No gating on it. So I'm just enhancing that sort of mid-range bark right around you know 380 hertz this is a dynamic eq because i don't i don't want that mid-range sort of clogging up all of the you know hang time in between the hits i just i just want it to be these bursts of of mid-range bark and here's a bunch more this one is just you know on all the time so the snare, without those sound like this Yeah, this is all just mid-range. And then here, I did gate this. So this is um, just low end for the snare drum. And it adds up like that. That's without it. And what's really imp important is how it complements the overheads. 
because that's really the main component of the of the drum sound is these guys right here and with these in there it adds that solid mid-range bark to it and then a little bit of the mono room so not a whole lot going on with these um, little extra low end there's some really great low end that um, these C12As were capturing on the drum kit mics and then just a little bit of the punchy part that's like 84 hertz and a little bit more of that sort of mid-range bark this is more around you know 580 hertz something like that and then I don't know if this is automated is this automated it is so yeah I think there's a spot where I'm turning this stuff up for the toms and then overall it looks like maybe about a DB of 1.5k with good old CQ and then this guy so this is the kind of move that I would have never done on my old speakers So um, I'm actually turning up a bunch of gain and you know getting this thing to saturate a little bit and then boosting 3.2k like on my old monitoring system I just would have never done that it would have been way way too punishing to listen to okay so that's what this guy's doing it's a big part of it just really cool presence in there and so the overheads originally sounded like that and that's with all the added stuff the mono room I had to do a little phase adjustment on this I'll show I'll, we'll get into that in a second and then this is also doing the mid-range bark right around 390 hertz and then it has that same slap on it that was on the um, the kick gated kick room thing so here's everybody together And so this phasing thing had to be automated because you'll hear that the tuning of the snare drum drifted. Um, you know, I always do do my best to um, get this. You know, try and lock in the snare drum tuning. I use lug locks, the little plastic lug lock things on there. But you know, snare drum heads stretch and drift and sometimes you know it just gets away from you you're just doing takes and focused on other things and whatever and so the take that I really love for the first part of this song the snare drum had the, the tuning had fallen flat quite a bit and so it's tuned lower and then all of a sudden when it goes into the next section the, <laughs> the snare drum is tuned quite a bit higher and so it required a different phasing orientation for that mono room mic so check this out um, And when the, t the snare drum was tuned lower, there was plenty of low end, so I didn't really need to do this, this adjustment. So then right here, after the drum fill, you can hear the tuning change. And so this, this phasing definitely helped between, you know, it's really trying to make sure that this mono room mic and these, and these drum kit mics are in phase so check this out that's with the adjustment that's without it that's with it just a little fuller has a little more weight behind it just a little hollow sounding
And so then we have this um, the spring reverb stuff. You can hear this. There's just barely a, any of it in there. I'll turn it up so you can really hear it. And I have another one of these 16th note delays on there. There's a, it's more delay than, uh, than dry signal. And, uh, yeah, this didn't get, whatever that was, didn't get used. Yeah, so it just blended in there a very tiny bit. Ultimately, I think, you know, I wanted this to sound more just like a drummer in a room and didn't, didn't want, you know, a bunch of weird stuff. I, I think I ended up using that, um, that spring reverb drum amp thing a little more on some of the other songs. It was just sort of set up as part of the, part of the recording setup. Um, so then <laughs> there's a couple spots here where there's these extra hi-hats. And these were taken from the stereo reference drum mix that I did while we were, you know, that we listened to while we were doing overdubs. And so there was just a couple places in the song where um, he, you know, this, the, the hi-hat was just played too soft. I mean, in general, I'm always asking drummers to not play the cymbals too, too hard so the cymbals don't get into everything. And he did a good job of that, but, you know, you're really trying to, like, hold back your right hand on the hi-hat. And there are just a couple places where the hi-hat just like disappeared. And so that was right here. So if I mute this, <laughs> you know, it's just like, they're, they're just kind of missing. He, he did play them, I think if I zoom in enough. Yeah, there is a hi-hat hit there. It's just way, way quiet. It looks like he, he totally missed it there. But, um, but yeah, this is the normal volume of the hi-hat you know, on, on these hits. And, uh, and this was just way too quiet. So, uh, so it was just a little fix. I just didn't want it to, it just, I felt the momentum of that drum groove. It should just be, you know, marching through and it sounded like it skipped a step there. So that was that thing. Um, the toms sound great in these mics. You know, the, the one over here is just sitting basically right above the, the rack tom, except it's not right up on it. So it actually sounds like a tom-tom. It doesn't sound like, you know, a microphone one inch from the drum head, which always sounds kind of stupid. And so this thing's up here, and I kept the cymbals kind of low. Um, so the hi-hat and the crash cymbal were kind of low, so those wouldn't overwhelm this microphone. And, um, uh, and so let me find a good spot where there's some toms, and so we can hear the, what they're doing. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, so it looks like Something's going on there. I'm adding a bunch of mid-range. Yeah, <laughs> automated EQ on the mid-range. Let's hear that in context. And I've been really into that. You know, when you listen back to like, um, you know, uh, some some of these Zeppelin records, especially like Zeppelin IV, you know, uh, end of Black Dog. You know, there's that huge drum solo thing at the end of that. The toms have this amazing mid-range aggression to them that I love. They're not this like super deep, boomy thing. Um, they're just, they're faster and brighter and more energized in the mid-range. And so um, I'm just trying to get that effect with these EQ moves. And it's really interesting when you hear it in context, I think there's a lot of low end of the toms getting picked up in that kick drum mic. And so you don't really hear this EQ move so much in context. Um, but I'm, I, I want the, the toms to like have that mid-range aggression to them. And in context, they still sound plenty full. You're getting a bunch of low end, you know, from other places, other microphones. Let's actually just figure out exactly where, they, where that's coming. Yeah, so there's a bunch of cool low end coming in there. The 
bunch of cool low end coming in there. Bunch of cool extra low end coming in there. And so, you know, this mid range thing is really just to balance it out. And like if I bypass this, is this happening on both of them? Yeah, so it'll bypass on both of them. They just, they don't cut through as well. And they don't feel as exciting. There's not as much energy in the sound. There's a bunch of boominess there, but I want to hear that rah, that like mid-range aggression in the sound. Um, so that's what's going on. And so, yeah, so there's no tom mics. There's just plenty of toms in the room and in that kick drum mic and in these overheads. And if they all add up the right way, and you've got a, you know, somebody like Josh Freeze playing drums where he plays everything with a lot of power and conviction, all that stuff will come out great. You know, you put a microphone anywhere near him playing drum kit and there's a great balance of all the drums. So um, that makes a, a, it's a huge part of making this work. Um, so that's the overheads. Um, the only other thing that I did is this mic over here for the floor tom uh, is, um, was not quite getting enough low end for the floor tom. And so I duplicated that microphone and every time the floor tom plays, um, I open it up with a sound that's just like a bunch of extra mid-range and low end sounds like that and you know with this stuff it sounds like that um, and with everything without it you know that floor tom sounds real thin and it's something that I've noticed on uh, some of the Zeppelin recordings um, you know, I really love uh, the song No Quarter. Uh, the drum sound on that song is incredible. The only thing that's not totally incredibly perfect on it is the floor tom. Sounds a little thin. And so, you know, they didn't, <laughs> they, they couldn't just duplicate a track and uh, have it only turn on when the floor tom hits. So this is one way to solve that. It's a big difference. Here it is with it again. Here it is without it. Yeah, like, that's not going to work, you know. Um, and so, yeah, so, you know, it's not that bad. It just takes maybe five minutes to go through and find those floor tom hits and just, um, you know, unmute those tiny little regions of floor tom stuff. And uh, you got a nice fat floor tom. So that's the drums. There's a little bit of percussion, This uh, these shakers. And these, I'm pretty sure, were done with a ribbon mic, probably Cole's uh, 4038. I love those on shaker. And these shakers are pretty loud in the mix when they came in. I think Andrew was really excited about ad adding these. And, um, and so, you know, they come in in a way where it's like, oh, wow, shaker. It's not like a subliminal, you know, kind of, you know, groove motivator thing. We really want to actually hear the shakers. So you really hear these come in. And it's good sound, you know. They're definitely, it's, it, it definitely sounds like um, uh, ribbon mics, and they were tracked onto a tape machine, so they're just really smooth and silky sounding uh, shakers in there. It's a nice little mid range crunch to them. All right, so then the bass. So the bass, uh, this is Chris Cheney playing his, um, his P bass. He's got a beautiful vintage P bass, sounds amazing, um, just through an SVT. And um, I like to uh, mic SVTs a very specific way. Um, I typically don't put a microphone right up on one of the eight speakers on the 8x10 cabinet. Um, I like to have it you know, two or three feet away, centered in, in the middle of either the top four or the bottom four. The top four are a little punchier, the bottom four are a little subbier. Um, this sounds on this recording is probably more the, the top four. And, um, 
and it's usually like a 47 FET or even a 47 tube mic. This was probably probably my 47 tube mic, you know, about 25 to 30 inches away from the speaker cabinet. And what you have to do is find that exact like center focal point of those four speakers and you get a much more natural, really beautiful mid-range. You know, when the, when the microphone is way up close on one speaker, it just sounds so like phasey and weird and kind of scooped out and it's just a mess. And so, you know, that's really how SVTs sound good to me. I, I always try and use that, um, that sort of miking, you know, position for, for 810 cabinets. And, you know, the sound came out good because I ended up not using this DI at all uh, on this mix. The kick is quite subby, so I, I didn't really need, like, DI sub. And, uh, and the, the amp sounded great. So it was really just adding mid-range presence. So there's, like, 10 dB of 1K here. And then another 6 dB of 1K here. And then this, like, mid, sort of low-mid punch uh, thing going on. So we can hear we can hear what all that's doing. Yeah, I mean that's a cool deep sound. It just will never fight its way through the drums and, and guitar. I need I need this that mid-range presence. So there's the 10 dB of 1K. There's another 6 dB of 1K. And then these punches, you'll hear it pop out. on some of those big attacks. And like, without all of this. You know, the, the, the bass just can't fight its way through. So, the, that's the bass, super simple. SVT, one mic, good to go. Um, so now, let's get into some guitars. So here is the acoustic guitar. So this was um, Slash's Martin guitar, and I believe it's a newer, I guess, reissue kind of thing of, of a Dreadnought. And uh, I can't, I think it was, it's a D28, but it's a great guitar. It's one of their like current top of the line type guitars. And it sounded great. Um, and I'm definitely doing the, you know, from the top and from the bottom uh, miking style that I've, I've talked about. Let me get my hands up so you can see it. So there's a mic that's sort of pointing, pointing down at the, at the low E string and one pointing up at the high E string. This is usually around the 15th fret uh, on the fretboard. I never put the mics in front of the actual sound hole. It's just way too boomy there. Um, and so then you get kind of a stereo spread across the strings. You know, it'll go low to high across the strings, um, across the speakers. So in this case, I ended up, I needed the acoustic guitar to sort of lean to one side. And so I did that by just turning down one of the two mics. And so uh, I don't remember which is which here, but um, uh, the you know, one of the mics gets turned down. So the so the acoustic sort of leans off to one side a little bit, and then there's a point where the 12-string electric guitar comes in, and I turn that mic down even more, so then it pushes it even further, and the whole thing sort of widens out and makes room for the 12-string um, to come in. So here's the, uh, here's the acoustic guitars. So here's this like 3.5K, 4 dB at 3.5K, a move I would have never ever done before. And then a bunch of 1.5K. So that's without the, all that mid-range stuff. Yeah, it just speaks better, sounds more balanced, not too boomy. It looks like I experimented with this vinyl thing, was not successful on the guitar, so I just left it off. Um, and then I printed a plate reverb on this, and I believe the original thing is mono, and um, I put this stereo slapback on there to stereoize it. And this is like a 16th note-y type um, slapback on there, and then lopped off 
you know, all of the low boominess on it. So, and it's, there's only a very slight hint of it in there. It's a pretty subtle blend of it, but here, I'll turn it up for a second so we can check this out. That's the original sound. I took all that boomy low end stuff off, so you just sort of hear it shimmering off, you know, some of the higher strings. And then this makes it more stereo. And here it is blended in there. We'll turn it up for a second just so you can get a better sense of it. So there's the acoustic guitar, and this is where the electric 12-string uh, comes in. So here's that pass, and these tracks, you know, I had limited tracks on this particular reel, and so these tracks were used for a couple of different guitar passes. There was um, the electric 12-string in this intro section, and then on these same tracks I had to punch in um, a distorted six-string guitar once all the big rock stuff happens. And so um, you can hear that transition happen on here. I'm sort of changing the panning and I set up a whole different track, you know, for a different processing when it turns into the distorted guitar. Um, so here it is in the beginning with the 12-string and then this is where it turns in, or yeah, this is where it turns into the heavier guitar. Um, and I believe these are the same signal yeah, they're the identical signal, but they're just processed differently. One for the clean guitar, one for the distorted guitar. And so this sound, I was just going for just straight up Stairway to Heaven 12 string. I, that's, <laughs> I just wanted that sound. And so I, I was pretty happy with this. We got, we got pretty close. Um, so here it is. pulling out a little bit of low mids, 300 hertz, almost 3 dB there, just to make it a little lighter sounding. And then good old soothe here, sharpness all the way up. I'm just dealing with overtones and this thing is just balancing out all of these overtones in the mid range. So check out with and without this. Man, it's, it's just a mess. And that is so beautiful. <laughs> I, I just can't get over that plugin, man. It's so, it's so amazing. I would have spent hours and hours trying to find this frequency right here and probably, yeah, it's mostly this stuff and probably this one here, but they're moving around, you know, and that's what's so amazing about this plugin. It just chases them around and balances them all out. It's so beautiful. So then this, um, this amp setup also had uh, a Leslie speaker um, as a part of the setup. And so in the beginning, it's off, and then later on when it turns into one of the main guitars, then the Leslie speaker is going, and I turn that up to just create a cool sort of swirly atmosphere. You can hear the Leslie a little bit in the room mic. So there's a room mic that's being blended in with this close mic. You can hear the Leslie swirling around a little bit in the room mic. So these two together. And there's that transition into the heavy guitar. So here, let, let's hear when this, um, when the uh, 12 string comes in and you'll hear this, this automation move right here that turns down the left side signal of the acoustic guitar. So it turns it down from 20, 27, 7 dB down to just have the acoustic move further to the right.
So you hear that move there. And this is how it works with the uh, 12 string. Just widens out, you know, makes space for that, for this guy to come in. And that's such a cool combination, you know, that blend of an acoustic guitar and a 12-string. Zeppelin did it a lot. Um, it's just such a beautiful, rich, you know, um, texture, that just the combination of those two things. So, so that's kind of everything up until, you know, we get serious and the whole band comes crashing in. So let's dive into the, into the heavy part. Okay, so... These are these big downbeats that are super important. And what ends up happening, like you'll hear on this track, this guitar track where the 12 string was, um, I made a duplicate of it because I just needed a different processing of it. Uh, the, you know, one of the heavy guitars comes in on that same analog track, you know, on the analog master. So when stuff got transferred into the computer, um, all of a sudden the 12 string, the clean 12 string turns into this like super distorted guitar. So that's right here. Okay, yeah. And this actually... Yeah, that does sound like um, Slash is modified JCM. I'm 99% I'm sure that that's definitely that amp. Um, that's what it sounds like. Um, so yeah, so this is, we're getting into the actual heavy rock guitars here. So this is what I ended up doing on a lot of this stuff. A um, little bit of extra weight in there, pulling out some of the low mid stuff. You know, that's sort of making room for the, the body of the snare drum. Um, a little 2K, and then a bunch of this, like, 9K, just to add some, some air on top. So, that's without it. Just sounds bigger. And then here's 3.5K, again, just not a move I would have done uh, <laughs> on other speakers. Um, but it's beautiful on this guitar sound. So like on the big heavy. That's without it. Just adds such cool energy and bite to the sound. And then taming some of the overtones with Soothe here, right in that real harsh range. So what ends up happening is, you know, I'm boosting in that range and then I'm using Soothe to sort of like balance out the overtones. So without Soothe... Yeah, it just smooths it out a little bit. Let's hear And now with Soothe. Yeah, I could probably back this off a little bit. back that off um, yeah I, I, I think actually listening again and sometimes yeah I'm monitoring really quiet now um, you know uh, it didn't need to be tamed that much um, I think that the, the extra bite in there was kind of cool so um, so there's that guitar and then this is the one where I ended up using the the Vox so
So that's the AC30. And here, you, I can, we can compare it to his Marshall. Yeah, you can hear an analog punch there, me punching on the tape machine, that little glitch in there. Um, I just like the punchiness of the Vox better. You could just hear the detail of what he's playing better. And then you add the room sound. You know, it's a nice big sound, but it has a lot of detail in there. It's just punchier. Um, so it just felt better in context. So this is how it ended up uh, in context. You know, it just feels uh, more expressive to me, you know, with um, the with the um, the Marshall, it was, um, you know, it was so, so saturated that um, you don't really hear um, the expression in the playing, the dynamic in the playing as much. So you can hear when he plays a little harder, a little softer. And, you know, with a part like this and, and uh, with Slash playing, I, I, th I think it's more interesting. It just feels more interesting. Instead of this, like, guitar paste, it's a guitar performance, you know. Um, so then... Um, try to see if there's anything else. Okay, the the other thing that I did on this, uh, yeah. So all this, I ended up printing my my cool, you know, SRE five hundred one, the um, spring reverb delay thing as just this like hovering sort of long ambience on the guitar. So each guitar performance has that available on it, um, and that sounds like this. I believe that's that's on there. And we should look at um, this EQ. There's some extreme stuff going on in this Vox. So um, so here's the here's the first round of EQ, just gouging out a ton of this real boomy stuff in there. Yeah, it's too boxy, boomy with all of this stuff in there. And here's that same sort of like 8 to 9K range. Just to add that open brightness in there. Here's 3.5K getting added. And then here's 2.3K, just a tiny, tiny bit. I mean, that's probably not even half a dB. And then me sort of smoothing stuff out a little bit. So... That was the original sound, probably why, you know, it, it was maybe just meant to try and warm up the, the Marshall sound, but with the right EQ, it's able to become the main sound. Yeah, and on this one, the, the soothe is, is really helping a lot. It just sounds more balanced and it starts to get kind of phasey and small and sort of tweezy sounding. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. And this was um, an adjustment to get it to blend with another amp. And so later on, I, I have the Marshall going when he's actually playing a guitar solo. And this was to fix the phasing between the two amps. Yeah, so this one I left in its original position. And this I just adjusted by a couple samples to get them to make sure that the amps blend right. And so we'll check that out later on.
So it's just these same two guitar tracks here. And so this is still his, his Marshall uh, with, with his six string, you know, with his Les Paul. And, um, you know, it's just set uh, with not as much gain as that other pass was where, uh, where I, I felt like it didn't work as well. And uh, it's really cool mid-rangey part when it gets... You can hear it with this room sound. And here's with a little bit of the, the SRE 501. Oh, and then this guitar now has its SRE 501 coming in. Yeah, pan to the same side. And oh yeah, there's another guitar that comes in here. And so then these two guitars continue on in this spot. So let's hear this guy. Okay, yeah, this is the, the wah-wah guitar. And so this I have sort of subtly right in the middle. I, I kind of wanted this to be, you know, like a big wide doubled guitar thing, but the, um, the wah-wah guitar added a cool little anchor in the middle. So we can hear that. Very subtle in there. And, uh, you know, and uh, Andrew's singing on top of all of this, so I couldn't have that, that wah guitar too far forward in the middle because that's, that's where his voice is hanging out. Um, let's, yeah, let's hear it with the vocals for a second. This is where his voice gets doubled. So you get this great thing with the guitars, you know, uh, wide out on each side, the vocals in the middle. The vocal is, um, when it doubles there, we wanted it to be a very intentional sounding double. So both tracks are equal volume and they're only just panned out a little bit, you know. So the guitars are panned out all the way wide and the vocals are panned out like 30-30, you know, something like that. <clears throat> so... Let's see, let's see the EQ on this, this wah guitar. So on this guy. Yeah, it looks like I just copied the same settings from the other Vox amp. Yeah, it's the same settings. Yep, 3.5K. It's the same sound. So I just, I just used the same settings. It worked great on, uh, on that other one. So copied them over. So, um, so then what happens is, you know, this guitar ends up uh, stopping here. And so this guitar ends up becoming one side of the doubled pair instead of being this subtle thing in the middle. So you'll hear it pan over to one side and come up in volume. And then a lot, a bunch of this washy delay spring reverb stuff. And that's, this is on the other side with its, with its SRE, um, you know, tape, tape delay and spring reverb. So then there's some interesting stuff happening with the drums here. So this, um, this kick drum thing, which was only this room that was only opening on the kick drum, 
when he starts playing harder and the part gets busier, he ends up, uh, you know, it ends up opening more on the snare drum, and I actually ended up kind of liking it. So when he starts playing harder, the whole drum sound gets kind of roomier, and so you can hear what happens here. So you can hear the snare drum kind of sneaking through a little bit. Um, it was a, it was a cool effect. I mean, it was you know it's kind of a random thing. It's just the gate is kind of misfiring a little bit here and there. But I, I think it actually worked in the con context of the song. You know, so I just left it. Um, the drums should get kind of a little more bombastic in that in that section, and having a little extra room, explosive room on the snare was a, was a cool way to do that. Um, okay, and so then we get into the guitar solo. The guitar solo ends up getting played on this same pass of tracks. And so when we got into the guitar solo, I ended up turning on all of the amps and doing a blend of them. Cause um, that was more, you know, what was going on when, when he performed that thing. I was sort of blending um, on the console for him to listen to in the room. And there was a, a blend of it that I remember we were, we were liking. So I tried to, you know, navigate my way back to that. So here's the guitar solo and he, you know, there's, it starts out a lot less gainy, and, and the only difference in gain is him turning up the volume on his guitar. So all the amps were set, he just turned down the volume, and uh, I think you can hear him turn it up at a certain point when it gets into the heavier part. Obviously, he's got a wah on there. That's where he turns up the volume on the guitar. And so then there's a spot where there's like a big reverb splash and I ended up printing this. So this is, um, it's a patch in uh, an H3000 that I've used a lot over the years. Um, it's a patch called Bigness and it's great for these huge like ambient sort of um, washes and uh, you can hear it by itself. Yeah, it's, it's essentially a tap a tap delay, so it's not super diffused. Um, you know, it's a pretty coarse sounding thing, a bunch of shimmering delays echoing off, and as it trails off, it sounds, it sounds more and more like just reverb. It's a beautiful sound, and, um, and none of the other reverbs that I had really worked as well as that one, so I ended up printing it into the computer. Mm. Yeah, so there it is in context. And so, I thought I would show, the main sound is really mostly the Vox and the Marshall. There's a little, a little bit of the silver tone, a little bitier. Yeah, no EQ on that. Okay, yeah, I messed this up earlier when I was, th this is pan center, I, I, I panned that uh, when I was comparing stuff earlier, uh, but all these would be in the middle, so. Okay, so this is, this is interesting. So I thought it'd be cool to hear this phasing adjustment here. So this is being delayed only two samples. And you can hear what it does. Yeah, so 
it just it's changing the phasing to emphasize a different part of the mid-range in the way those amps blend together and this thing needed to sing more a little bit in the lower lower mids and not in the really bitey area like the the amps themselves had plenty of bite to them especially that that Marshall and so without it and it just sounds a little fuller to me with this on there little little pinched um, without the phasing adjustment And I think it, it allowed me to have the, the guitar solo just more, more out front, like really, really in front of the band. The, the, the guitar solo in this version is mixed really loud. And it should be, you know, it's uh, fucking Slash, man. He should be loud. What right out in front. It's really great. Yeah, so no EQ on the Marshall. Just a little bit of grabbing some of the overtones with Soothe. And I ended up not altering anything here, making the adjustment. This guy needed to go later in order to make everything line up right. No EQ there. Okay, so I think we can get into vocals now. So um, let me turn on the vocal bus. Here it is. Dun, dun, dun. Andrew's got such a cool voice. Man, I, I really enjoyed recording him. And of course, you know, we, we wanted to have it sound as sort of classic and timeless as possible. Um, he's got such a, a, an incredibly distinct, really iconic sounding voice. So I ended up using um, an RCA 77 uh, ribbon mic for his vocal. And uh, at the time, the, it was not in the greatest health and it had this really mid-rangey quality. So that combined with his voice, you know, made this, <laughs> you know, really intense effect. Um, so you can hear here... Uh, what's going on with the horses that you ride and the feelings left inside comes a time you need and i'm basically just lopping off everything that's below his, you know the fundamentals of what he's singing and even tucking those in he's singing lower in the beginning here and um and i i just have it lopping all of that stuff off some extra air on top this is like 15k a little extra mid-range that's right in the range where he's singing ultimately and this is a very broad move so across the entire range that he's singing soothe is just evening out all of the individual resonances in his voice you know so you can see particular overtones sticking out in places and it's just you know evening them all out and so it makes it easier to get the vocal to sort of just blend with everything and not have these weird overtones that poke out that make it sound like it's too loud or it's not cutting through enough or whatever and so then a little more mid-range even right in the same frequency range, there's another dB of 1.5k. And a little de-essing. The other thing that's happening is, um, I'm sure you can hear it when he was playing in the mix, there's a Leslie going on, so I put his vocal through that same Leslie rig. And so here again, just lopping off everything that's below the register that he's singing in. With the 
uh, and even a bit of the, the resonance, you know, the low resonance in his voice. When you get further in, Yeah, so this is like, you know, a guitar amp that's distorting a little bit. It's got a little spring reverb on it, so it creates a, a weird little swirly space um, around the vocal. And uh, it was just, you know, I just wanted to put a unique um, texture on his voice. Um, okay, this is present stuff, a bunch of 5.6K, plus 4, 5.6K. And then a bunch of um, compression on here. And when I do this on Leslie's, uh, I bet, I, I bet this is, uh, multi-mono. It is. So, when I'm compressing Leslie's, I don't like using a stereo-linked, um, stereo compressor, because one of the issues that I have with, um, with Leslie's is that the volume difference as the horn is pointing to one side or the other is really dramatic, and... It's already enough for me that it's getting brighter one way or the other, and um, I don't need it to also get way louder on each side. I can hear it sort of going past from one side to the other. And so I use multi-mono compressors unlinked so it, dicks, it, you know, it dips each side as the volume's coming up. And so the levels say, stay more consistent, but you still hear the motion of it. Um, and it's not like all of a sudden super loud on this side and then super loud on that side. Um, so that's, that's important for me with Leslie's multi mono compression uh, on those. And I just wanted this thing to just be, you know, totally flat dynamically. I didn't want it to be sticking out in weird ways. So that's without it, and you can hear it sort of fluctuating back and forth more. So then, these, this is these guys together. Finally, it's all gone. So, you know, it's got a nice little distortion on there and a little swirly texture on there. I thought it, it, it was a nice, you know, unique texture on this song. Um, so... Try to complicate you. So this is without all the stuff. You can hear how kind of boomy and boxy it is. Possessions are left for recollection. And finally it's all When you clear all that out. Then the vocal sits on top of the track. Mute the Leslie for a sec. So now there's all this stuff floating around down here that is competing with the bass and the guitars, the low end of the drums, all of that stuff. Get that out of there. And now he sits on top of the music. So it's so important. there's the double coming in, so here's the double. You see the, the main track got panned left, 35. This track got panned right. All of these settings are basically the same. You can see I just copied them all. You use the same mic, same, se same setup for all three of these vocal tracks. And then he goes off and does this big wailing vocal thing. And the reverb on that is just this. Revive 2 um, with this large natural plate. And you know, it's it's on his vocal throughout the song, and just in this particular spot, I just I just turned it up. Super easy. And so it's kind of the same thing here.
so so that you know that's kind of everything we got got through all the stuff um it's it's nice to know that um <laughs> in some way you know i'm i've i'm hoping I'm, I'm still improving at this in some way or another um for for me that's a massive difference and um and it was really really fun and interesting for me to dig back into these um into these multi-tracks and you know hear what was there and hear how it could really um you know speak through the through the speakers so um so there you go that is slash by the sword um i you know pulled up everything i could possibly think of about it was recorded we went through all the all the plugins and all the stuff and how it was all mixed the mix bus stuff so um that's how it all came together on this new version which in my opinion was vastly better than the original um, i think i'm going to send this to slash and just go like hey <laughs> by the way check this out um It'll be funny. We'll see what he says. So thank you for checking it out. I'll see you next time. Bye. You put the who's in on the what's in. Attach the what's in to the who's in. Connect the thingamajig to the thingamabob. And that'll make the whatchamacallit go. You hook the gidget to the gadget, adjust the gadget, to the gidget, unhook the dingly dang from the diddly doo.